Faisal Bakin, uh, it's so good to see you again. Uh, we've worked together and it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, you're massively known in the SDS and the AATS, but for those of you who don't know Faisal, he's a professor of surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. He's got a special interest in revascularization. He's been uh, involved in the AATS Clinical Practice and Standards Committee. He is Mr. Guidelines and Mr. Revascularization. So it's a real pleasure to have you here. And the real reason we've got you here is because of the brand new publication, the 2023 AHA ACC Guidelines for the Management of Patients with Coronary uh, chronic coronary disease and, uh, and and these are big these are massive these are the recommendations that we need to follow in our heart team approach guiding revascularization so I maybe would love to just hear from you first of all what their sort of highlight recommendations are in this new guideline particularly with regard to revascularization and then we'll talk about how they came to make these decisions. Joe first of all thank you very much uh, does my head still fit into the screen after all the good things that you said about me? <laughs> that was very kind. Uh, we, we, we follow your lead about critical thinking and innovation, and uh, we're really proud of our relationship with you. I mean, over the years, we worked together, and I really appreciate that collegiality, friendship, and uh, your expertise and collaborative approach and scientific acumen is, is, is also very renowned. So um, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you today. And to be with our audience, I know you've got a really fantastic and diverse audience. So I'm going to try and be basic, but also take it a little deeper into the details. So these are my own opinions, by the way. Everything that I say today reflects my own personal opinions. So please uh, bear that in mind. With regards to the 2023 um, chronic coronary disease uh, patient management guidelines, the surgical community was disappointed. Um, the document itself had some really excellent content, um, virtually in everything related to stable coronary artery disease, except the section on revascularization. So we have to be clear uh, about that. And, and why do we have a problem with the revascularization section? Well, because it was a replica of the 2021 ACCHA Sky um, guidelines on revascularization. And in it, cabbage was downgraded without meaningful evidence, without relevant evidence. And what they did was downgrade cabbage in patients with normal left ventricular function and in patients with mild to moderate LV dysfunction relative to medical therapy with survival as an endpoint. So cabbage remained the class one in patients with multivessel disease and severe LV dysfunction, but in those with normal function, it dropped uh, to class 2B, and those with mild to moderate dysfunction, it dropped to class 2A. So that is the downgrade that, I mean, there are other issues as well, but that is the, the downgrade that really was, was um, unexpected and unjustified. They also equated cabbage with PCI when it came to MACE, and we know that those two modalities are totally different. They're actually complementary rather than competing, but uh, we, we can address that later on if we have time, but we should focus perhaps on the downgrade for survival relative, relative to medical therapy. Yeah, and, and maybe say a few words about that evidence. I mean, we've got the syntax trial, we've got 10 year follow-up of syntax, we've got uh, uh, Stuart Head did an amazing meta-analysis of several studies showing the superiority of CABG uh, over PCI in these patients. I mean, are, are you convinced like I am that this is grade one evidence of CABG superiority over PCI? Well, you know, that issue, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. Relative to PCI, the 2021 guidelines have given the upper hand for cabbage in patients with three vessel disease that is complex, especially with a higher syntax score. So that's not an issue of controversy. They acknowledge that, and that is consistent in the 2023 recommendations. So... Our argument was, if you're saying that cabbage is superior to PCI in survival, regardless of the EF in patients with three vessel disease, how could it be of questionable benefit compared to medical therapy? So that's one of the, um, if you'd like, uh, schizophrenic <laughs> aspect of the guidelines. I mean, 
unless you're insinuating that PCI is harmful. And there's no study that was ever published to confirm that PCI is harmful compared to medical therapy. So with regards to the evidence specifically between cabbage and medical therapy, the evidence that we have for in randomized patients between medical therapy and cabbage is the Salim use of meta-analysis that clearly demonstrated the survival advantage uh, for cabbage, regardless of the EF and the European study, which again demonstrated the same, even in patients with two vessel disease and proximal LAD. But the guideline committee said, oh, these are old studies. Medical therapy got better. And we said, yeah, yeah, we agree. We, that's why all our patients, we'd like them to be on optimal medical therapy. Uh, and and if, if you look at cabbage, cabbage has improved as well. And we bring to their attention that in the Salim use of meta-analysis in the 90s, the 30-day mortality of cabbage was 3%. In the FAME 3 study that just that got published recently, um, the 30-day mortality of cabbage was three in a thousand. So cabbage perioperative mortality decreased by a factor of 10. So did medical therapy improve by a factor of 10? <laughs> I, I doubt it. So, so, so the idea of those studies are old and that medical therapy is better, uh, need, they need to actually acknowledge that cabbage got better as well. So then they say, well, we're gonna present you with new evidence. Well, that's where the problem is. The new evidence really is not relevant to cabbage versus medical therapy. Why? Because the ischemia study, which is the main study, the cornerstone of their um, downgrade, did not randomize a single patient to cabbage or PCI for that matter. It was a strategy whereby you use a conservative approach where you just treat them medically or you do a diagnostic cath, and then based on the diagnostic cath, you could decide if you want to vascularize or not. So not a single patient was randomized to cabbage. Secondly, um, only at less than 25% of patients had cabbage. Three quarters of the interventions were actually PCI. And finally, how many people you think had severe proximal LA disease? Very little, 36% actually had greater than 50% proximal LAD disease. I can't remember the last time that I did a cabbage on a patient without a significant proximal LAD lesion. So clearly ischemia, nor the meta-analysis that they cite are based on randomized evidence in which cabbage is adequately represented and in which the complexity of, and, and the atherosclerotic burden of those patients are taken into consideration. Because if you look at the STS database, you find that many more of them are diabetic compared to the ischemia population. And you find that two to four times um, the STS patients are more likely to have severe peripheral vascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, or heart failure compared to the ischemia patients. So, uh, Faisal, on, on behalf of all surgeons uh, worldwide, really, I, I just want to say a huge thank you for your bravery because you were actually on the committee in, tw in, this, in these guidelines. And, you know, you and Mark Rule actually had the bravery to say this is wrong, this is not right, and, and walk away from this. Do, do you want to say a little, bit, a little bit about that and why the technical methodology was wrong uh, in the creation of these guidelines? Yeah, we basically explained from the get-go that the 2021 committee did not take um, those um, facts into consideration. And we also stated that we agree that ischemia is useful, but it was taken beyond the scope for which it was designed. So what the evidence really shows is that it is reasonably safe to treat patients with stable atherosclerotic coronary artery disease uh, medically at, as first line and to follow them up very closely and then offer them intervention as needed. But those patients need to satisfy the, the, the ischemia population criteria in terms of their atherosclerotic burden and, and their physiologic risk. So we said, well, maybe we should say that um, it is class 2A 
for medical management in three vessel disease um, with, with those criteria. Um, but they said, no, that's contradicting the 2021 guidelines. And Mark Rule and I reasoned again why the evidence just does not match the recommendations. And then we were told, well, you can't contradict, or I'm going to use the word that was used, you can't relitigate the 2021 guidelines without new evidence. And then we counted that we are a scientifically independent committee from the 2021 guidelines. Now, please, I got to make that very clear. That discussion wasn't between the members of the writing committee. That was between us, the surgeon, and I'm just going to say the leadership. So it was the leadership that gave us instructions, instructions that are counter to what we expected. Um, and we expected a robust, scientifically independent um, writing committee that will make their own judgments, that would vote without duress and would vote based on what the evidence demonstrates. So that was disappointing. And therefore, we actually, despite us, as we wrote in our rebuttal that was published earlier this week, despite participating in almost every single call that we could make it to uh, for the writing committee, writing our sections, reviewing multiple other sections, um, we, we, we reached a point where it came to the vote. And it was important to us to make it clear that we would not participate in the vote unless our concerns are heard, unless the science is given a for, fair opportunity to be reviewed and decided upon uh, by this new and very, very talented committee that I'd respect, completely respect, me and Mark Ruel. But we were never could reach that stage, unfortunately. And with close discussions, discussions between me and Mark and the ATS and STS, we decided that the best course of action is unfortunately um, to end our participation. It, it was a sad moment. We, we put in a lot of hard work and we had the solution, we had the proposals, they were all constructive. And, and I'm fairly confident we would have had the momentum to reach a good and uh, accurate recommendations and comprehensive recommendations we were given that opportunity. Because again, we had a, an excellent uh, writing committee that I have tremendous respect for. So I don't blame the writing committee for the final product. I really don't. Well, I mean, again, for me, from all surgeons across the world, I mean, you were outnumbered in this committee and just so many congratulations for standing up for what you know to be right. And I suppose the last question really is, is what can the STS and AATS and, and surgeons around the world do uh, in this situation, what do you think we can actually do against this? We are always found that we are outnumbered, aren't we? Seven to one, 10 to one. Uh, so so what, what do you think the next steps should be for us as a community of surgeons? Well, yeah, I mean, we love our cardiology colleagues. We, we got along with the writing committee members just fine. And at our respective hospitals, we work really well for the most part. I mean, talking to my colleagues, cardiologists and surgeons work really well together, except when it comes to leadership levels and the guidelines, uh, there's a disconnect there. And, and, and I can't quite understand why this should exist. Um, if you look back historically, the surgeons worked really well uh, with ACC and AHA that produced excellent guidelines, uh, guidelines that were contradicted with the current ones, unfortunately. So maybe we should have serious and honest and open discussions about how we want it to uh, progress in the future. We all want it to work. There's no question about it. We all want it to work, um, cardiologists and surgeons. For a starter, I think for procedure-based guidelines, we should be like the Europeans, whereby the surgeons, if, you, if we're talking about revascularization in PCI versus cabbage, then you should have 50-50 representation between the interventional cardiologists and the surgeons. There's no reason why you wouldn't. Now, in disease-based guidelines, it gets a little bit more complex because you need to introduce non-proceduralist, but that is fine. And I think what we have in the STS and the ATS, and I think the Europeans do, is a Delphi process, whereby you need a 75% plus agreement to pass 
a recommendation. Um, the current ACCHA guideline process, as we pointed out in our rebuttal, is only a simple majority. Um, and the surgeons will never achieve that. So if you use a Delphi process, if you make it totally open and totally transparent, and even include dissenting discussions and dissenting opinions, uh, allow a period for public comment, respond to the public comment, I think all our, well, nearly all our problems or the significant problems will be solved. Um, so I still think there's room for us to collaborate. I don't see a future where the surgeons and the cardiologists, well, long-term future, let's just say, uh, where they wouldn't work together on guidelines. But right now, I think the surgeons have done their, um, have extended an olive branch. We, we were critical in our rebuttal, but the last paragraph was, we look forward to working with the ACC and AHA, where there's a fair process, a robust process, unbiased process, and an open process. Transparency is critical. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Faisal. And thank you again for your, your amazing leadership for revascularization from, from all of us across the world. It's been an absolute pleasure having you talk. And, to, and I think uh, we, we really do need to get behind you and we need to, to do those things that you said to, to get behind uh, our surgical friends to try and push forwards uh, to, to maybe correct this in the future. Uh, and so for myself at CTSnet and everybody here, thank you so much for joining us and providing that honest opinion. Joe, it's been my absolute pleasure. And, and one last thing that we have to mention, and I'm not gonna uh, consume any more time. There is strong literature and evidence about the dangers of postponing cabbage when it's indicated um, and doing high risk cabbage in patients who are in urgent situation or diminished EF is something that you wanna avoid. So we're doing this for our advocating for our profession working together with our colleagues and also protecting our patients. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I love your membership and I look forward to being featured in the future when we uh, pass that hurdle. Let's just put it this way. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Joel.